Shall we start? Yeah, we can start. Yeah, Mayang, we can start. Okay, I start. Dr. Tati? Yes. What? No. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, respected doctors, professors, colleagues from Asia, and also from other parts of the world. Welcome again to the Federation of Asian Organizations for Radiation Oncology, or FARO, webinar series titled Radiation Oncology Services in Asia, Sharing and Exchanging Experiences During COVID-19 Pandemic Era. Thank you for joining us again for our second session in the series tonight. For those of you just joining us for the first time tonight, our warmest welcome to you all. My name is Mayang from IROS Indonesia. It's very nice to meet and greet all of you here again. So this FARO webinar is the beginning of a collaborative platform during this pandemic that we hope will be strengthened in many ways in the long term on the regional level at least. And I truly believe that these sessions will be fruitful for all of us. And we are joined here by the respected FARO officers, advisors, and council members and the panelists, as you may see there. And the other seven countries representatives of FARO are ready to share their experiences during the pandemic with us for this second session. So now, before we begin, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Zoom webinar features, may I briefly introduce, at the bottom of your screen, you may find the Q&A Q &A box. So you can click it and type in your question at any time during this webinar. Kindly, if you can, uh, write down your name and country and the speakers or chairs will answer your question during the Q&A session after the presentations, or they can also write their answers down for you there. And for the Q&A session, if you would like to speak directly or ask a question, you could also click the button, uh, raise hand. So when you click on the participant box, then you can see on the right side, on the bottom, there will be a raise hand box. Now, uh, let's begin our panel session. May I introduce our respected chairs for this evening? Professor Sham Srivastava from India, the president of FARO, will guide our session along with Dr. Tomoaki Tamaki from Japan, the deputy secretary general of FARO. So these respected chairs with no doubt will lead us with a very wonderful session this evening. So to Prof. Sham and Dr. Tamaki, I hand over the session to you. Thank you. Professor, I think your mic is still um, muted. Yeah. Can you, can, can you hear me, Maya? Yes. Yep. yes. Yeah, so, sorry. Thank you, Maya, and uh, along with the Tomo, uh, on behalf of the FARO, uh, I welcome you all uh, for this uh, webinar, which has been organized by the young FARO people who have really done great work. Uh, this is the second in the session. And the first was uh, with the seven countries, uh, which was Bangladesh, China, Korea, Mongolia, India, Myanmar, and Singapore. And the remaining four countries of the FARO which is Indonesia, Japan, Mongolia, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Thailand, and Pakistan will be presenting today. And I'm sure that the first was uh, wonderful uh, where uh, all these seven countries have given how they have coped with the pandemic with the radiation oncology, radiation therapy treatment. Uh, during the, the meeting with the FARO officers uh, and uh, uh, with the uh, consultants, we finally decided that we should have the webinar, at least to know all of uh, the how we are doing and what we can do. So the major aim was to strengthen the communication with the radiation oncology in the Asian region so that we know each other what is going on. And also to really set up a platform uh, for the collaborative study. So I think once we really know each other what how the things are going on, and uh, how to collaborate and how we can go and do some more study. Also, it was uh, really very good in the first session when we had 
to learn the effective and the safe radiotherapy options that uh, we have been practicing. And also we can share the perspective of the radiation therapy during the COVID-19. So it was in uh, the experience with all of us and um, we like to collect all the experience uh, uh, for all the Faro countries and also know that how we can do and further possibly we can do uh, some more collaborative study. And that was the aim of the Faro that we come together in the Asian region and finally come out with something and strengthen our own, radi our own radiation oncology in this area. And I'm sure you all must be going and I will really urge all the members uh, who have come here to really go to the FARO website with uh, Dr. Tomo will also has uh, put in the FARO.Asia so that you will uh, see that how the work is going on. Currently with the, all the young um, uh, radiation oncologists, we have come out with the newsletter and uh, which is giving a lot of information uh, in the current area. And we hope that in coming period of time, there will be a good collective uh, publications through the newsletter to all the members which can really go uh, and see that what we can do in the Asian region. So I again welcome you all for this uh, important session. And uh, we really hope everyone to really communicate with each other and come with uh, something good ideas in the region. Asian region so that we all can grow together. Thank you very much for joining and um, I'm grateful to all of you who have joined here. Thank you. And I will uh, request Dr. Tomo uh, to carry on the further proceeding. Good evening and good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomo Tamaki from Japan and uh, I'm a Deputy Secretary General of FARO and I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing from seven countries uh, tonight on their status on COVID-19 and radiotherapy. Um, before we start, um, Dr. Murata from Japan and Dr. Mayan from Indonesia has done uh, basic um, surveys to prepare for the, this webinar. And uh, Dr. Murata will just quickly um, introduce the, the result of the survey um, so we can get the overview. And then we would like to move to the presentation from each country. So Dr. Murata, um, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you Dr. Tomachi. So uh, can you see the slides? Okay, I will start. So, so we have a survey of the effect of the pandemic on the radiotherapy service in advance of this webinar. So I'm going to give you an overview of this survey. So we received the survey data from these five countries from uh, this research. Thank you for your cooperation. And the first question is choose your country's public health measures, strategies or regulations. So, um, so for personal measures and the physical and social distance, um, um, they were involved in all countries. So there were two countries uh, that had city lockdowns. So the next is uh, how did your department or society contact uh, COVID-19 situation and provide safety environment for patients and staff. Um, in all countries, they had created safety protocols. And so in 80% of the countries, they were using uh, PPE. And so, Next, uh, surprisingly, so in two countries, they had a confirmed case of radiation oncologist. And so in most countries, the society published guidelines or uh, recommendations to support medical staffers. So and then in three countries, they had a confirmed case of patients. So in some institutes, staff could be quarantined if a patient became a confirmed case. And so some department issued uh, more risk to screening and reach for the patient before entering. And every patient uh, who are going to undergo radiation treatment must have a negative swab test. So in the next, uh, have a department or hospitals being forced to shut down due to numerous activities or the reasons. 
Fortunately, it seems that departments or hospitals have not been closed down in all countries. And so this is the last question uh, is how does this decision affect decision making regarding the radiation therapy? So in 80% 80 80 countries, uh, they consider the hyperfractionation methods. So and in some countries, so all safety procedures for patients and staff were adhered strictly. And so extra PPE is provided and uh, mandatory for treating birth therapy patients. So that's all. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I finished. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Morata. Um, this effort to collect information from all the countries is very useful, and we're hoping to um, do a more um, comprehensive survey after this webinar so that we can collect the data and hopefully we're able to share this information among ourselves and with others from outside um, of Faro and globally. So with that, um, we'd like to start the uh, presentation from um, the seven countries. And the first country will be um, Japan. The presenter will be uh, Professor Yasushi Nagata. Um, professor Nagata is the professor and chairman of the Department of Radiation Oncology of Hiroshima University. Um, he is the chair of the International Committee of JASTRO and also one of the board member of JASTRO. He's representing uh, JASTRO in the uh, FARO and is a council member uh, of FARO from JASTRO. So I will hand over the microphone to you, Professor Anagata. Thank you, Dr. Tamaki, for kind introduction. Uh, I want to talk about the current status of radiotherapy in Japan for COVID-19 infection. I want to talk about the four topics today. Can you go to the next slide, please? OK, this is the number of new COVID-19 infected patients in Japan. So th this is a stage of uh, you know the end of September, and the first infected patient was detected on January 16th, and the Tokyo 2020 Olympics was decided to postpone on March 24th, and the state of emergency was declared between April 7th and May 26th. All schools were closed between March 2nd and May 31st. Now we are thinking we are at the end of the second wave. Next slide, please. I think, you know, Tokyo 2020 Olympics games was, were postponed between July 23rd and August 8th, 2021. And also Paralympics games will be postponed between August 24th and uh, September 5th, 2021. I hope to welcome all Asian athletes and uh, international athletes to Japan next year. Next slide, please. Also, this is the number of active COVID-19 infected patients in Japan. By September 29th, 2020, the number of COVID-19 cases reached 83,000 infected patients and 1,500 deaths. That means around 1.9% of the all infected patients. And the population of Japan is 126 million. Next slide, please. This is the number of severely ill COVID-19 patients in Japan. That severely ill means, you know, the patient using ventilator or in the ICU. So at September 29, uh, 2020, the number of severely ill COVID-19 cases was just 151, and is also decreasing. We have enough emergency room in the bed. Next slide, please. So to achieve both infection prevention and the social economical activity, now Japanese government is encouraging domestic travel with subsidy. That means go to travel campaign. And also government is encouraging to go to eat at restaurant with subsidy that go to eat campaign. And also you may know overseas trip to Asian countries can be possible step by step. Next slide, please. 
our society just law did the below things. We established COVID-19 ad hoc committee on April 10th, and the weekly webinar on COVID-19 was started since April 16th till September. An urgent recommendation was announced on April 25th, just a recommendation for daily practice and guidelines for clinical protocols with COVID-19 was announced on May 12th, 20th, and July 90th. And also national wide survey with COVID-19 was done twice at May 11th to 22nd and July 13th to 27th. I'll talk about this in detail. An urgent recommendation was announced on 25th because a very famous Japanese actress, Kumiko Okae, was dead of COVID-19 pneumonia on April 23rd. She was with breast cancer and received radiotherapy after breast conserving surgery in January and February this year. Her Entertainment agency and many TV programs cause radiotherapy for immune weakness of her death. Therefore, many patients with breast cancer during radiotherapy were in panic. Therefore, JASTRO and Japan Breast Cancer Society announced the safety of radiotherapy for breast conserving patients on April 25th. Now, the patient is not so in panic. And uh, just uh, we, we announced the just uh, recommendation for daily practice and guidelines for clinical protocol with COVID-19. That includes radiotherapy for COVID-19 infected or suspected patient, and guidelines for head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, palliative radiotherapy, particle therapy, and blood therapy. And the PPE, personal protective equipment for patients and the staff, and the temporal and the spatial separation at the center, and tips when the radiotherapy therapy staffs are infected with COVID-19. Next slide, please. We did a national wide uh, survey with COVID-19 twice in May and in July and we accumulated uh, the answer from 545 institutions. On the left-hand side, you can see the study in May. On the right-hand side, you can see the you know, uh, research in, in July. That means in May, around 41.2% of the all institutions uh, uh, announced that the decrease in patients. And uh, in July, also 36.5% of all institutions uh, uh, experience the decrease in number of the total number of patients for radiotherapy. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, you know, uh, regional differences in patients for radiotherapy. You can see that we have a little bit of difference in Tokyo, Osaka, and also urban or suburban area, but uh, in almost all you know, uh, area, so we experience the decrease in number for the patient for radiotherapy. Next slide, please. Also, this is the adoption of more hypofractionated schedule. In May, 32.3% uh, of the all institutions answered yes. And in July, a little bit increased, so 34.7% of the uh, institutions answered yes. Next slide, please. And this is very important slide. So radiotherapy institutions where uh, radiotherapy patient or radiation staffs were infected by COVID-19. As a result, only six institutions, 1% out of 504 institutions experienced uh, you know, COVID-19 infections. Uh, staffs uh, in, were infected at two inf institutions, one technologist and one nurse. And uh, in hospital patients of radiation therapy were infected at the three institutions. And outpatient clinic uh, patient in of radiation therapy was infected at one institution. Radiation therapy department must be closed for five days at one institution and only one day at one institution. 
and not close of, of the, uh, all the other institutions. New patients must be postponed at three out of six institutions, and the treatment of COVID-19 infected patients was done at only one institution. Next slide, please. So these are the you know, preventive measures for COVID-19 at May and July. So sorry for busy slide, but uh, you know, on the left-hand side, you can see this is the measure for patients. So temperature measurement at home or at hospital or mass hygiene, you know, social distance. These patients, uh, you know, uh, increase in July. Also on the second center is the temperature measure at home for staff and temperature measure at hospital around, you know, 99.2%, you know, mask and hand hygiene are maintained. And on the right hand slide, you can see the you know, degrees of radiation therapy patient or degrees in radiation therapy consultation or prolongation of international observation. So these emergency measures were less adapted in July. Next slide, please. So there are many requests for just So continuous webinar about COVID-19, updated guidelines and recommendations and continuous announcement of the safety of radiotherapy to the public and the consider regional differences and institutional differences in Japan and increase insurance reimbursement for hypofractionated schedule and the open consultation counter for COVID-19 adjuster. Next slide, please. So the summary of the of our nationwide survey means, you know, 36% of institutions Increase and answer the decrease in the number of radiation therapy patients in July. This is a very serious, you know, problem. Also, preventive measures were strengths for radiation therapy patients and staff, and the emergency measures were less adapted in July. Six institutions, just one percent, reported infection of COVID-19 at radiation therapy department, and the radiation two radiation therapy departments were temporarily closed, and many requests were sent to just Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is the number of medical checkup in 2090 and 2020. You can, you can see, you know, on the, this red line is, you know, this year and this blue line is last year. You can, you know, notice that in April and in May, remarkable, you know, decrease of the medical checkup. This is very serious and uh, the number of medical checkup in 2020 decreased down to 67% of that in 2019. Next slide. This is my final slide. So uh, I talk about the current status of radiotherapy in Japan for COVID-19. And I want to announce that we have just finished uh, our 33rd annual meeting of JASTRO uh, by Dr. Shirato through uh, online. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nagata. It was really very good and very comprehensive presentation uh, of the status of uh, the radiation oncology in Japan uh, through the JASTO. So thank you very much. And uh, I will request uh, all the participants, if they have any question, please put it on the Q&A box so that uh, Dr. Nagata and uh, all the other uh, members can also answer your queries. So thank you. And then we move to the second presentation, which is from Indonesia. And Dr. Shri uh, is going to uh, uh, say about the, uh, the status uh, of radiation oncology in Indonesia. And uh, Dr. Shri Murtya uh, is a very senior radiation oncologist uh, at the Chipto Hospital in Jakarta. And I, I know her for almost last uh, 35 to 40 years. Uh, she was trained in Europe and also in Japan, uh, in NIRS in Chiba. Uh, she is currently the head of the Indonesian Radiation Oncology Collegium and also in charge of the national competence and standard and the board examination. And I know her that she has been involved in setting up of the radiation oncology program, training program in Indonesia, which is basically training and education is her passion. So I request uh, Dr. Shri to have her presentation. Dr. Shri, please. Okay. Thank you, Professor Sam. Okay. 
Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start my presentation about radiation oncology services in Indonesia during COVID-19. This is our uh, outline. Uh, the first, we I speak about situation COVID-19 in Indonesia, and the second about the COVID-19 in cancer, and the third is situation in my uh, department in Ciptomanung Kusumo. Here, the incident and mortality of COVID in, in Indonesia right now is in the dire situation. Here we can see that at, in this week, the COVID-19 incident in Indonesia is ranked 21, 21 rank in globally, which is, it is a quite high. If we look at uh, the data in Indonesia, uh, in Asia, Indonesia in the top of the rank with the additional uh, new cases is 4,850. But in for the cause of the death, Indonesia in number three with additional 180 cases. Compare the other uh, Asian countries. Indonesia, look, is growing, not growing, but increasing uh, in the cases compared with the Malaysia, or no, Sing Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, or Cambodia. That is uh, the flat situation. Even India and Philippines is uh, going down in the cases. We still have not seen the end on our first wave. Okay. This slide uh, shows the proportion of the COVID-19 uh, cases in Indonesia with a total number of positive cases, 300. 20,000 uh, and additional with the new cases in this week, if 400 and 80, uh, 4,000 and 80, 50 new cases. But uh, if we look this, the recovery for patient is quite high, but the death is 3.6 percent and active cases is 20.3 percent. And here look that uh, Jakarta is the largest contributor. Uh, we look at the, the active cases, this and recover and also is that cases is really fluctuative and the death causes uh, of the patient is come from Jakarta. This is the situation where the The situation where the um, cases in Indonesia, but this uh, center with the laboratory for the examination of the uh, COVID-19. But not all of the province, not all of the area we have. This is the government regulation uh, from president, government, and uh, also from uh, Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Finance, and many more. 
children of the COVID-19. But uh, the impact, what has been more concerning in the death of our doctors, as a, early this month, we have lost uh, 131 of our colleges. Most of them are GPs. So this one is point that our country is also struggling with. It. So as we know, cancer patient experiencing immunosuppression is more susceptible to COVID-19 infection. And cancer patient infected with COVID-19 19 will experience civil morbidity compared to non-cancer COVID-19. It's only 8%. From total positive COVID-19 cases, we look that 1.5% uh, are patients with uh, cancer patient. And you know, the death cases is point. 0.5% from the cancer patient. So it is uh, the recommendation from IROS. Therefore, uh, considering that all outpatients are cancer patients, then we need to take seriously adjustment for our radiation. Um, of course, the radiation oncology services and taking into account uh, daily risk versus benefit of their treatment and hospital visits. All our centers in Indonesia are open throughout <clears throat> the patient the pandemic, but of course, we have taken serious adjustment and precaution. Oh, but situation in the department. Hospital, as a place to treat six people, has a high possibility of contributing COVID-19 transmission. Hospital has a few overcrowded places, such as the waiting area. Adaptation and extra measurement is needed to be done to ensure that every person coming to hospital to access healthcare does not transmit or get infected with uh, COVID-19. This is uh, the zonation of our hospital. Um, the, this, this one, it is for the uh, COVID patient. Uh, the people COVID-19 uh, are placed in this, in this area, and to the transmission. And people with high risk getting infected by COVID-19 are kept away from the red zone. But this is the, our hospital, our department. It's not too far from the... So um, here, the patient, the patient in our host, our department is in uh, decrease, but uh, in August, August and September is uh, relative stable. Of course, uh, the number of patients have shown decrease trend during this month, but workload is still quite hard considering that we also need to decrease and shorten our staff and see. Our data also show here that compared to the general population of Jakarta, which is the positive rate is 0.7%, the rate in our uh, department, including doctor, trainees, and staff, is 
percent. Compression is about three percent, much higher than the general public. And among IELTS member nationality, we have, um, we have we have had eight of our colleges positive with COVID, which uh, make it four. Uh, 0.8 percent, but now all of it has already recovered. Iros has also published a guideline which serves as a basic for every center in Indonesia to operate during COVID-19 pandemic. In our center, we made adaptation in staffing facilities and patient management to ensure adequate services during this pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, our staff have been trained, training and briefed about the COVID-19. This ensured all of the staff to keep a safe protocol during services. Our staff are required to Feel daily health from uh, to daily health forum to screen the possibility to, of infection and are given a, appropriate PPA according to the level. Our center also made a strict working schedule to lessen their workload. So uh, we have four level of PPA which is made uh, according to their job desk and their risk of getting infection of, or transmitting infection. Our center also modified its facilities. This one, our uh, leveling. Yeah. Our center also uh, modified its facilities such as screening area. This is the TSA screening for the COVID and also this is the for look. Uh, we do physical distancing in here. So for the surface continuity facilities, we also put the uh, mark here for distancing. So here in the pantry also we put we to distancing and some modification uh, of patient in patient treatment area made hypofractionation in is encouraged to be used not urgent patient and follow up patient are encouraged to use telemedicine to reduce the need of going to hospital. Patients who need to go to hospital for care or for screen for the possibility of, of infection and ask to use FESMA all the time. Before treatment, every patient must undergo to a rapid or swab test. Online education is also being held regulatory. This for non-urgent patient, lower priority and follow-up patient are encouraged to switch to telemedicine to avoid unnecessary, unnecessary hospital visits. This slide shows uh, the IROS categories for the priority patient or priority cases indicated for irradiate during, during end pandemic. This one for urgent cases like a spinal cord compression or SPCS or rapid growing tomorrow. This urgent for uh, irradiation, but other cases it's like uh, hypofractionation um, for the target irradiation during 15 or 20 minutes patient, including bunker cleaning time. Also for brachytherapy, boosters are recommended during pandemic. 
Brain therapy can be performed only if level for PPA are viable. This was uh, example of cases uh, with RT can be postponed. It's like breast, post BCS, T1, T2, and zero. It's just only hormonal therapy. We can postpone radiation can up to 20 weeks. Also in meningioma, we can also, uh, just observation. Benign tumor, of course, just observation. This is uh, the example where the cases where uh, radiotherapy cannot be given. It's like in breast, post BCS with BCIS histology, it's alternative modalities for monotherapy. Also uh, in brain, low grade glioma, glioma post op. Also, RT is not mandatory. So it, it can be postponed. So explore the possibility of teleconsultation. If not possible, uh, consult directly. If not possible, consult directly uh, at the nearest cancer center with trust oncologists. It's like therapy location. Can be treatment be done in the nearly living area. Therapy schedule with therapy should be continue right or, or schedule. Which one can be delayed? During treatment, whenever there are symptoms, signs of an emergency, immediately go to the nearest emergency room. And for the procedure things, ask the regulation of the local hospital health service facilities and national health insurance like BPJS regarding change to the procedure for the taking medication for the chronic cases during COVID-19 pandemic. To ensure an adequate telemedicine procedure across all radiotherapy facilities in Indonesia, I was also compile a telemedicine guideline which has been adopted, this one. And our center also perform regular online present education during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We have a flyer, this is also um, education for the present with tele. And in situation, uh, in, uh, situation of emergency for the patient need uh, radiation, we have a uh, follow condition like this has been discussed with the multidiscipline and must consult with PNR team. There is adequate PPA available done and dove uh, properly when treating patient. The patient is treated at the last session and exercise radiotherapy unit via dedicated entry. After that, the bunker is waiting room must be clean with adequate infection. So this is the protocol that we conduct in education for training or resident things that have been made. Uh, in regular disinfection, disinfection to prevent contamination, study room and courage, physical distancing to prevent transmission, online education whenever possible, regular training, and the use of appropriate to PPA. This is a uh, routine activity for the, uh, in our department. For the trainee, look at this the, in the morning report and journal reading. Also, we look like this, the distancing. Uh, we do distancing for the, uh, the activity. 
Also, we do a uh, virtual tomorrow board by tele. This is uh, the examination comprehensive uh, national board examination. It's the last, maybe in the, in the last. And the ILOS also perform regular CMA education to ensure an up-to-date and functional as refresh for every radiation oncologist every week. The speakers for this program are invited from other departments and international speakers. Uh, and you, you all, our colleagues and friends, are all welcome to join us at any of our events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Sri, um, for the presentation. Um, I guess that the uh, the number of patients for COVID is still in the trend of uh, increase in Indonesia, and I hope things will uh, um, improve soon. But it also seems that the uh, IBRUS is taking this um, situation as an opportunity to um, strengthen the training um, opportunity for residents and and doctors, and I think it's a very positive um, side of this, this situation. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so this time we'd like to go to the third presentation from Pakistan. The presenter will be the Dr. Uh, Mohammed uh, Fahim. Uh, Dr. Fahim is the president of Pakistan Society of Clinical Oncology and also the director and chief oncologist at Atomic Energy Cancer Hospital, uh, Nori uh, Islamabad. Um, he's the Dean of the Faculty of Radiation Oncology at the College of Physicians and Surgeons, Pakistan. And he has received the, uh, the Presidential Pride Performance Award um, in 2018. So without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Fahim from Pakistan. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is there another? Yeah. System preferences. Okay. Hello, Nikhil. Why not? Here, Nikhil, the presentation. Yeah. Can you stop the presentation? Hello. Can you share the screen? Yes, I'm trying to do it desktop one. Okay. What did you do? What was the system preferences? By the way, just for this occasion, um, I think one of the positive thing about the, this COVID is that the Indonesia, you guys uh, published the, a paper in Green Journal on the, uh, the status of the COVID in radiotherapy, right? Handoko, Dr. Handoko. Yes, um, yes we, we, we published uh, in the Green Journal how we face the problem of COVID in our all our center of radiotherapy in Indonesia. Good. Uh, we encourage everyone to see that paper from Green Journal. Okay. So, Dr. Fahim. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, we can see. Okay. This is the map of Asia, and here you can see the the Pakistan and before going into my presentation, I would like to congratulate Professor Thwar Tati and IROS for arranging the series of webinar for this during this pandemic COVID-19. So this is Pakistan I am representing. So the situation, if you talk about the COVID-19 situation in Pakistan, so this is the as of today's uh, data, which I am sharing with you. So number of confirmed cases, which are more than 317,000. Active cases are more than 8,000 and number of deaths are 6552. 
And if you look into the recoveries, they are 302,708 as of today, which is 95.3%. So the, in, down below is the break breakup of these cases. Here you can see these are divided into our provinces along with the capital city and Kashmir. So this is a graphical representation of the daily tests done and the number of new cases. So green bars are showing the tests done and the red ones are the number of new cases. And here you can see a peak that was uh, in the month of June uh, 2020. The first case which we was reported in Pakistan was on 24th of March 2002. And this peak was uh, in the month of June because of the month of Ramadan and then our religious festival Eid was there and because of Eid people went for shopping and gathering and the other places. So the number was increased and then it gradually it is coming down. So here you can see the number of uh, total tests done, total confirmed cases, total deaths and total recoveries. So the this blue bars, they are showing the number of total tests done. The, the pink one is the number of total confirmed cases and the red line below is the total deaths. And the purple, uh, this line is showing the total recoveries. So here you can see the, the, this graph is showing the total active cases versus total confirmed cases. The blue uh, one are the active cases and the, the green lines is for the confirmed cases. So as in the other graph, you are seeing the total deaths which are in red and the total recoveries in green one. So how is radiotherapy department adjusting to the pandemic situation? So. This is what we are doing. We have the policy which we have adopted is differing non-urgent patient clinics, thermal scanning of patients and employees, PPEs for healthcare professional, it was mandatory, uh, social distancing and waiting areas, signs marked in areas requiring queue management, sterilizing patients' documents through ultraviolet germicidal irradiation system. Standard hygiene procedure, in radiation treatment rooms, patient's couch sanitized after each patient, immobilization devices sanitized after each patient, shield installed on office tables of doctors, appointment time for radiation treatment scattered across the day and hospital staff works in shifts. So what we else uh, we have done is that educational material about hand hygiene, the sign and symptoms of the COVID-19, high risk travel or exposure, and the important uh, cases reporting new symptoms to their healthcare worker is in various patients areas and also announcements are made through the throughout the day. Go to a top, go to a top. So we we place the, uh, the information uh, material in local language and in English uh, in, in the hospitals and in the public areas so that the people must understand that uh, what COVID is, how you can prevent COVID and how you can protect your hand hygiene and how you can tackle with this menace. So this is uh, these are the other uh, another slide showing the how to wash the hands and the two are placed in hospital gates. We are not permitting any patient or attendant or relative or hospital staff without without mask or anybody with temperature. So the appointments are given on the date uh, the, uh, on the gate of the main gate of the hospitals, and the numbers are written outside. So these are the thermal scanning of the patients. We have got the sanitization gate, the hand washing, and these are the social distancing. In not only in the waiting areas, but also in the reception, even in this uh, pandemic, we are uh, doing our activities of uh, Pinktober as well. 
the, the shield for the doctors is placed in every room so that they can be protected. In the lifts and in the treatment machine, the PPEs along with all protective measures which we have taken for the patient's treatment. Although the number of patients are decreased as far as the treatment is concerned, but the emergencies like uh, co spinal cord uh, compression, the bleedings or the superior venical obstruction patient where they were not denied and they were treated. In the, my hospital, because the requirement was only of the Institute, so only six uh, uh, persons, they were infected, one radiation oncologist, one medical physicist, one RTT, and three general attendants. So the number was not so high. What we did in our hospital that we screened all the employees, which are more than 300, regarding the antibodies and out of them 23% of hospital employees were COVID-19 antibodies positive and they were asymptomatic carriers. This was very alarming for us. So after seeing this, we have increased our all protective measures as well. So the impact on our radiation services, the OPD was reduced up to 50%. Clinically appropriate hypofractionated radiotherapy schedules were used. Radiotherapy deferred according to patient's diagnosis, stage, condition, and treatment intent. So MDTs, they were hold, uh, we held the MDTs through teleconferencing system and Zoom. They were never stopped. They were, and the, in, in few cases, we took the opinion from the other specialists via telephone or via email. So what PSU did, they, we developed our own uh, guidelines for, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic developed in my hospital and they are placed in the, uh, our website. The address of website is down below. <clears throat> So hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. And we pray that the God forbid us with this COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fahim. It was really very nice presentation. And uh, it was nice to see that uh, the number of people who are uh, getting all right are uh, increasing over the period of time and um, all the uh, measure, all the measures were taken especially all the precaution and uh, so that the number of people which were affected were much less so uh, all the guidelines everything are in place so that was really very nice and uh, the number is not really very high there so thank you very much for your presentation and uh, we will move for the next presentation, uh, which is from the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Manuel Martin Lopez is going to present and give the details of uh, the COVID-19 situation and uh, the position which is uh, there in the Philippines. Dr. Martin is currently the chairman and the active radiation oncologist of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the St. Luke's uh, Medical Center in Quezon in Philippines. Formerly, he was the residency program training officer. Uh, he did his uh, doctor's uh, degree in 1996 and currently working at uh, the St. Luke's Hospital. So I will uh, like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Martin to give presentation for the Philippines. Dr. Martin, Thank you very please. Thank you very much, Professor Sham. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, here, I'd like to share with you our experiences in COVID in the Philippines. So the first confirmed COVID case was announced in the Philippines on January 30, 2020, with a 38-year-old female foreign tourist testing positive for the virus. At the same time, at another part of the world, this is when WHO activated the highest level of alert by declaring COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern. Now, it was Manny, only after two months. Health Manny, guests. do you have slides? I am presenting it now. Well, I don't think it's shared. I cannot see this. 
screen. Oh, I'm sharing it now. Okay. Please uh, try again to share the screen. Okay. Share again there. Mm, no. There? Yeah. Oh, coming, coming. Yeah. Oh, there, there, there. Good. Good. Yeah, it has come. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Start this, yes, slideshow. But you can hear me, okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, is this fine? Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can. Yeah, we can see. Okay, thank you. So the first local transmission was recorded on March 7, two months after the uh, first um, identification of the foreign tourist with a, a virus. Uh, so on March 7, we had the first local transmission recorded. This was the only time when the Philippine government mounted a multi-sectoral response to COVID-19 through agencies chaired by the Department of Health. Now through the National Action Plan on COVID, the government aimed to contain the spread of COVID-19 and mitigate it, uh, its social economic impacts. The Philippines first in Metro Manila was uh, uh, quarantined. Huh? Uh, then it eventually expanded to the different islands surrounding the Philippines, um, wherein uh, quarantine among all households and closure of all non-essential private establishments uh, occurred. So uh, there's a curfew, public transportation was closed, travel bans imposed, mass gatherings were prohibited, uh, checkpoints were installed all over the city, Face masks, not just face masks, but also face shields were required whenever you go out in public. Social distancing was enforced. Temperature checks were done whenever you enter establishments or checkpoints. Uh, apps using QR codes or manual signing of contact tracing forms were also required whenever you enter a building or any other office. And the government expanded the country's testing capacity from just one laboratory to now we have a 142 Licensed testing, lab, licensed testing laboratories across the country. Um, also, there were mega swabbing centers established wherein they repurposed sports arenas, colleges into swabbing centers using PCR swab kits. As of September 2020, over 3 million have already been tested. Now the government also worked towards ensuring that its healthcare system can handle surge capacity. Uh, again, they established uh, several community quarantine, st quarantine centers, converting sports stadiums, hotels into quarantine centers. And also they established COVID referral centers like the Philippine General Hospital and the Lung Center of the Philippines. The government also addressed the social and, and economic impact to the community by giving uh, cash subsidy to the uh, indigent patients affected by COVID. Then the National Insurance Corporation also provided advanced payment to its accredited hospital so that healthcare can continue. Frontline workers were also compensated. They were given risk allowances in addition to their hazard pay. Now, the highest recorded uh, new number of cases in just one day was in the mid of August, middle of August, wherein they recorded close to 6,500 cases in just one day. And then the most number of deaths uh, occurred towards the end of August when we had 250 deaths. Uh, slowly the curve is going down, the trend is going down and hopefully it will flatten soon. As of now, we have 327,000 confirmed COVID cases, 273,000 of whom have recovered and close to 6,000 deaths all over the country. Now regarding active radiation oncologists, uh, we have 99 who are actively practicing all over the country and four of whom contracted COVID. Uh, two of those had mild to moderate symptoms and the rest were asymptomatic. Regarding our radiation oncology residents, we have 48 all over the country. Only one contracted COVID and was asymptomatic. We issued a survey within the society uh, regarding the average number of patients treated per day as you can note here before the pandemic, 55% of those who uh, responded to the survey uh, treated more than 40 patients per day in their sub, um, respective institutions. Now during the pandemic, you can no longer see any blue 
part of the pie chart because none of the institutions are, all of the institutions had less than 40 patients per day. So uh, most of the patient census of all hospitals decreased by more than 50% during the peak of the pandemic. Are there any specific protocols to treat cancer patients with COVID? Uh, 80, 81% of the hospitals who responded do have their own protocol, protocols, while 19 didn't have any. So what the pros did, or the Philippine Radiation Oncology Society did, was they formulated their own guidelines to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID within RT facilities to allow cancer care to continue. Now, each radiation oncology department adjusted their uh, practice. You know, they were encouraged to follow these guidelines with appropriate modifications made to adapt to each institution's specific needs and capabilities. So these guidelines were based on the best available evidence published and or accessed online between March to May and by consensus from inputs by the membership of the PROS and others. So it's a very comprehensive guideline and I'll be showing it to you, just the salient parts. Um, thank you to Dr. Kathleen Valdivia for authoring the guidelines that I'm presenting to you now. So the most important part is to adhere to standard and transmission-based precautions. Assume that every person is potentially infected or colonized with a pathogen that could be transmitted in the healthcare setting. And under the standard precautions, most importantly, of course, you have your hand hygiene, using alcohol, 60 to 95% alcohol, washing your hands for at least 20 seconds. Um, and then of course, uh, the use of, the proper use of PPEs. Uh, what we do is we follow the WHO guidelines for this. Just check out their website. And of course, physical distancing, allow non-essential staff work, and non-essential staff to work from home as possible, as often as possible, consider uh, skeletal shifts, practice rotating schedules with your physicians, and then of course social distancing, keep a distance of uh, 3 to 10 feet or 1 to 2 meters apart. Screening of staff, uh, of course you have to take their temperature daily, and it's important to note here that in some institutions, they do PCR swab for all their healthcare workers every 2 to 3 weeks, including the doctors. For minimize chance of exposures, try to educate your patients and visitors. Um, ideally, you should inform them to wear their own masks upon arrival at the facility. Again, follow the WHO advice on the use of masks. Screening for symptoms and appropriate triage. Evaluation and isolation of individuals who report symptoms should strictly be done. Now, no walk-in patients will be entertained. They should come strictly by schedule or by appointment. Limit and monitor points of entry to the facility. Take steps to ensure everyone adheres to respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Hand hygiene again, very important. Limiting each uh, patient to one accompanying adult is recommended. In some settings, patient might, uh, patients might opt to wait in their cars or outside the RT facility where they can be easily contacted by mobile phone. And then again, social distancing, keep a distance of three to 10 feet apart or one to two meters in waiting areas. Additional strategies include implementing alternatives to face-to-face -face triage and visits, such as teleconsults and telemedicine, defer elective procedures, surgeries, and non-urgent outpatient visits, utilize temporizing measures, such as giving ADPs for intermediate or high-risk prostate cancers, Considerations for all patients include whether it's possible to avoid radiation therapy, delay radiation therapy, and if not, shorten radiation therapy delivery by using hypofractionation or short course regimen. Implement engineering, uh, engineering controls, for example, uh, putting up physical barriers or partitions to guide patients through triage areas, putting up curtains between patients in shared areas, installing air handling systems such as HEPA filters, and implement environmental infection control. Ensure that every environmental cleaning and disinfection procedures are followed consistently and correctly. In screening patients, typical questions include, have you had fever,
cough or difficulty of breathing in the past 48 hours? Have you tested positive for COVID? Or have you been in contact with any COVID positive person in the past 14 days? Have you lost your sense of smell? Um, new patients should be screened for recent travel, both domestic and international. Uh, patients should be screened by phone or by telemedicine the day prior to their appointment. Patients under treatment should always wear the mask, even during treatment. Uh, likewise, be screened prior to each fraction. Testing of all patients prior to any procedure such as EBRT or brachytherapy is both prudent and reasonable. In most institutions here in the country, PCR swab test is done. Uh, scheduling of new consults and new patient starts, again, use telemedicine and teleconsult. Uh, for outpatient visits, we categorize patients uh, using priority A, B, and C, wherein uh, in extremes, you have priority A, you have the most unstable post-operative patients who need to be assessed in person and should be seen immediately, while priority C patients are those who can be seen remotely or delayed until post-pandemic period. Palliative care patients should also be screened for whether radiation therapy may be omitted or if other palliative treatments may be used instead or whether or not it's possible to delay treatment. So let's go to treating patients who are infected with COVID. As the pandemic progresses, it's inevitable that every RT facility will have to deal with the issue of treating patients with COVID. Considering the length of time it takes to interpret, uh, interpret test results, we should assume that a patient with suspicious symptoms is infectious. Managing these patients will require physician discretion, personalized to each patient and clinic. MDT consults are highly recommended if available. Again, going back to the survey, 90% um, of those uh, who responded to the survey have treated or are already treating patients with COVID. And 92% of the hospitals do conduct MDT consults, mostly via Zoom platform. The rest use Google Meets and other platforms. Now, by treating COVID patients, set up separate well-ventilated triage areas, isolate suspected COVID infected patients as soon as possible to just one section of the department. If equipped with several linear accelerators, dedicate at least one machine for treating all COVID patients. Consider allocating specific entrances and exits for these patients to minimize exposure to other patients and staff. The patients again should, ask, do be, should be asked to wear their masks and of course, the staff should be fitted with appropriate PPEs following the WHO guidelines. Schedule treatment for these patients at a specific time of the day, such as during after hours or end of day shifts. They're usually treated last. Ensure treatment schedules can properly accommodate the cleaning needs for any areas used by patients with COVID. Store fixation devices used by infected patients separately from all other equipment. Defer treatment of infected patients until asymptomatic for at least 72 hours. Now this goes for hospitals who are not equipped, well equipped to treat patients with COVID. Some institutions even suggest uh, not to treat patients unless they have two negative swabs. The for treatment of patients requiring respiratory support for COVID associated car cardiopulmonary symptoms until they're stable. Increase the use of hypofractionation when possible personalized altered fractionation plans for patients who have interrupted treatment. And then we have set up parts where you have the cleaning and disinfecting of equipment and offices. Uh, just one last part uh, here in that section wherein you have establishing reporting within and between healthcare facilities. I highlighted the healthcare facilities should discuss changes to standard cancer treatment pathways within their operational delivery networks. This may include discussing alternative dose fractionation schedules or radiotherapy techniques. Uh, just to show you uh, an example wherein we have a head and neck specialty group that's, that was formed uh, by members of the pros from all over the country who, who, uh, who specialize in treating head and neck cancers they were able to formulate specific guidelines for treatment of patients with head and neck cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, that's it for the Philippine presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Manny. Um, Thank you, Tom. And good slides that the, uh, we need to remind everyone that the FARO 2021 is scheduled to be held in Philippines and hopefully that the oh, yes. <laughs> situation will improve. Um, I, I thought the, uh, the, your strategy to screen um, patients and also the staff was, was very extensive. Many, I think uh, much more than um, many other countries in, in FARO, I thought. And your experience of treating uh, COVID positive patients with radiotherapy was was new to me. Actually, um, uh, I got the impression that many of the patients get treatment interruption. So um, that was interesting. Oh, thank you. Uh, we continue the treatments. Most of the most, if not all, institutions continue treatments, but the census really went down because we had mm -hmm. problems with transportation when they when they had the community quarantine. The public right. transportation was closed down, so uh, the treatment centers became inaccessible to most of the patients. Right. Well, thank you very much, um, Annie. Um, thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, we'd like to go to the next uh, presentation from Thailand this time. Um, the presenter will be Dr. M. Jai um, Stapara Nux. Um, she is the professor of the Division of Radiation Oncology and Department of Radiology of Chiang Mai University. And she is a FARO council member from Thastro. Um, she's the, also the chair of Northern Thai Research Group of Therapeutic Radiology and Oncology, and also the head of Chiang Mai Cancer Registry of Maharaj Nakorn Chiang Mai Hospital. So without further ado, um, I'd like to give the microphone to uh, Dr. M. Jai. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of Thai Association of Radiation Oncology, TASTRO, uh, I would like to present the radiotherapy service during COVID-19 in Thailand. Uh, first of all, I would like to update the Thailand situation of COVID-19. As mm -hmm. of today, we have the confirmed case in total of 3,628 patients with the new cases uh, for six people. And six people, new cases uh, from, the, uh, from, uh, from return from abroad and stay in the quarantine places right now. And uh, we still have patients under investigation in the total of around 400,000 people. And um, right here on the right hand side on the screen, we see the traveler screen uh, tra of entry. As you know, that we have a very long border, actually in the western side of Thailand. So. The ground port, uh, we, we have the screening at ports of entry at ground entry port, at ground. mostly around uh, uh, 2 million uh, people together. And this is the timeline of COVID-19 incidents in Thailand. We have the first case uh, confirmed, of course, and you will see that we have the peak of the new cases uh, very much in March and and um, April, April. So at that time from April, uh, very early of April, the government announced the emergency decrease to curfew and strictly lockdown. And since then, the new case, uh, incidence of new cases is quite low, um, as you can see in this slide. So I would like to divide it, the incidence of COVID-19 cases in Thailand into three stages. The first stage is uh, from imported case from uh, January to late Jan. And stage two is the cases limited local transmission from late Jan to late March. And stage three is widespread cluster cases from March to April. And after lockdown and um, uh, emergency decree, by the government. Uh, right now, in the past 100 days, 
the COVID new uh, COVID-19 cases detected have been only in people who were uh, infected in other countries and were diagnosed after arriving in Thailand. And right now there have been no reported cases due to local transmission. Uh, anyway, uh, the Ministry of Public of Health uh, always to follow preventive measures, including social distancing, regular hand washing, avoiding touching the face, or wearing masks when you go out, visiting crowded places, or coughing only into a folded elbow or a tissue, which should be disposed of safely. Uh, back to the radiotherapy service, how the pandemic affects the radiotherapy service in Thailand. I would like to show you in this uh, table. Uh, we divided into which is occurred in April to May 2020, and right now, so the change in patient number treated uh, is decreasing uh, during this strictly locked down in most centers in Thailand, but in some centers that I have the two star here had increased. That's just some, um, not too many centers, but some are radiotherapy centers in Ministry, uh, Ministry of Public Health Hospitals. Um, they had suspended all non-urgent elective surgery. So the cancer uh, patients would be referred to radiotherapy department. So in some centers would be increased. The change in workload also related to the uh, num patient number treated and also change in waiting time, uh, it's still uh, longer than uh, normal during the strictly lockdown. And if, if you compare to right now, the situation as, to, as of today, we are back to normal, uh, nearly normal, I would say that. Uh, I would like to show you the data from uh, one training center in uh, Thailand. I uh, would like to show you the average number of patients treated before uh, the pandemic era. We have around 190, but during the strictly lockdown period, um, April and May, uh, we dropped down to 120. It would mean uh, about 30% decrease in patients treated in the, this center. Another center is the hospital from the Ministry of Public Health. The, uh, the average number uh, before the pandemic era is 160. Since uh, the strictly lockdown is decreased to 130 and decreasing about 20%. The next question from Fraro is how do you handle multidisciplinary team in this pandemic situation? With a survey by phone, um, we, many centers use the teleconference, uh, even in the departmental teleconference or in the hospital uh, teleconference. Some centers use online consultation and some centers uh, use Q radiotherapy online request in some center. The next is um, uh, the next question is: Are there any specific protocols to treat um, cancer patient with confirmed case of COVID nineteen? Um, I would like to say that right now, as of today, we did not have confirmed case in all RT centers in Thailand. But if it occur, I mean, I I I, I will not <laughs> to have any patients to have uh, COVID nineteen in every center in, in, in Thailand. But if the cancer case uh, with COVID-19 need to be um, uh, treated with radiation therapy, all cancer cases with uh, COVID-19 infection need to be isolated and treated according to the National Health Platform uh, Ministry of Public Health that I have shown in this slide. Uh, the next question is, are there any specific protocols to treat cancer patients with confirmed case, confirmed case in RT center. And, and what exactly have the department or society performed to deal with the situation? I would like to uh, group uh, for the uh, prevention and protection measures for 
first uh, and let you uh, compare between before COVID-19 and the 19 pandemic the, for healthcare personals. Uh, I would say that we uh, use surgical masks or lab coat, but not all 100%. But for the new normal, uh, only in RTT, mainly I, I would say 100% right now wear surgical masks and wear N95 masks in case with droplets or case with uh, endotracheal tube intubation and wear surgical gowns, surgical gloves. For other personnel, uh, uh, wear only surgical masks and lab coat. For the patient and caregiver before COVID-19, we didn't have any regulation for them, but the new normal that we have now, they must wear surgical masks or cloth masks before coming to the centers. And uh, for the caregiver also, we limit only one caregiver to come into the department and must wear surgical masks or cloth masks. Uh, yeah, general screening was performed. Uh, we do screening temperature before entry to the hospital. And uh, in the waiting area, uh, we also have the social distancing. That would be uh, nothing before the COVID-19 pandemic. Era. For patient grouping and prioritization for service delivery, uh, this is the policy of most of RT center in Thailand. For the emergency uh, and palliative, we normally we use hypofractionation for this group of patients. But for the new normal, uh, we kind of use shorter course hypofractionation. For example, if before COVID-19, we use three times three grade, three grade times 10. Uh, for the new normal, we use a single eight or uh, for grade times five, for, for, for example. And for the curative, uh, normally before COVID-19, uh, most of centers use conventional fractionation, but um, uh, during the uh, COVID-19, uh, many centers try to adopt hyperfractionation scheme, especially uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, even in head and neck cancer. In, uh, for head and neck cancer used in all some centers. Uh, for the patients, uh, follow-up patients who had active problem uh, before COVID-19, we do routine follow-up, but um, the new normal, we use telemedicine consultation or um, and, and the follow-up with inactive problem, we delay the follow-up and most of them refer out to the uh, nearby hospital. And this is the prioritization um, in, in one training center that I asked them for uh, to show a view. And most of our centers use uh, kind of very similar to these centers. So we have five priorities together. Uh, the first one would be definitive RT or CCRT for rapid, rapidly proliferating tumors such as uh, cervical cancer or head and neck cancer. Number two is for urgent palliative radiotherapy. Uh, for ex uh, example, malignant spinal cord compression uh, with some intact neurological function or tumor bleeding. For the third priority would be definitive radiotherapy for less aggressive tumors or postoperative radiotherapy for R2 resection. Uh, the fourth priority is palliative radiotherapy ther through alleviation of symptoms. But uh, before that, we try to use other um, treatment modalities to help them. Uh, and the last priority would be adjuvant radiotherapy for our zero resection in low risk cancers. And um, for the number of staff at work during the strictly lockdown, uh, we reduced the number of staff at work um, only, should say, during May or June in some centers only because uh, we have quite a limited resources in some centers, but in uh, not busy centers and have many staffs, they divided each specialty, I mean, uh, both uh, Redong, MP, or RTT into two groups and rotate between work at hospital and work from home. And that's all for task so thank you. And I believe that we will win together. Thanks, Tomo. Thank you, Dr. MJ. It was really wonderful.
and very nice presentation and we were really surprised that uh, there is no local transmission currently in the thai thailand that was really very nice and so you are not having any case which are positive with the covid 19 uh, with the yeah. cancer isn't that is that true <laughs> right now it's true i mean in every rt centers <laughs> But, Wonderful. Uh, no, yeah, well, but in, in Thailand, I mean, not in RT center. I I don't know, but in RT centers, I quite uh, right. exactly true. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, that's really very good. In fact, so government has really taken care very well, and the people are really following. So that's important. And obviously, you are taking all the measures, which is really wonderful. So thank you very much, Doctor Imray. Uh, no, it was really very nice presentation. Uh, thank you. Now we move on to the next presentation, which is from Mongolia. Doctor Oenchi Mag uh, segment is going to present that, and uh, Doctor Urna is uh, the vice president of the Mongolian Society uh, for Radiation Oncology, that is Mostro, and she is also the chair of Radiation Safety Committee and Radiation Oncologist for the National Cancer Center in Mongolia. Uh, she is from the uh, national cancer center in ulanbator in mongolia and she has uh, studied the doctorate program uh, at hiroshima university and at that time she worked on the stereotactic body radiation and also she has worked on the intensively involved in the clinical research and professional uh, community working group and she is dedicated for the teaching she has also worked in the iaea between 1914 and 15 and conducted some systemic reviews on overexposure of radiation therapy so she has been well affiliated with the iaea so i would like to invite uh, dr urna uh, to give her presentation for the mongolian society thank you dr urna please thank you professor shimistova for your nice introduction could you uh, show my presentation? Yeah, you can share the screen. Yes, yeah. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very honored to given an opportunity to share radiation therapy series in Mongolia during COVID-19. Please move next to this slide. Mongolia is located between Russia and China, uh, where the first out COVID outbreak first started. And we have the uh, 2.3 million population, and uh, half of which lives uh, in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. Could you move next slide? As for now, in a worldwide, confirmed cases are around 36 million, with total death of over 1 million. Compared to that, the confirmed cases in Mongolia are 315, and 308 of them are recovered. For now, there are no deaths are reported. Our first reported cases of COVID-19 was in March, which was imported from the foreign contract worker. Could you move next slide, please? Out of total 315 cases, seven patients are currently being treated at National Center for Communicable Disease, one of which is now under critical condition. I have to mention that all COVID-19 cases are imported from other countries. There are no domestic cases of COVID-19 have been reported till now in my country. Due to government responded quickly to the outbreak in early stage. Could you move next slide, please? The most cases we found among male compared to female. The most peak period of COVID-19 in Mongolia was in early June. The reason why is that students who were studying in Russia returned at the time to their home after they were infected which concludes the most patients infected with COVID-19 are young in my country. Please move next slide. As for the public health measurement strategies, regulations, first 
Okay, so responding to COVID-19 started from 27 January 2020. During that time, all schools were closed and uh, public events were canceled. We closed air and land border with China. And after a while in March, the government closed air and land borders with Russia. All commercial flights, passenger train, and auto traffic into and out of Mongolia have been suspended until further notice. We aggressively encourage the public to wear masks, use sterilization, and keep social distance. Children under 12 years old were not to enter public places such as shopping and food areas. Please move next slide. As for Phase two, uh, the country has undergone the full state of heightened awareness on 24 of the March. We extend the duration of pub public restriction during that time. Citizens are prohibited to travel countries that are affected by outbreak. As for now, which is a phase three, we partially transferred to state of the heightened awareness. We reopened secondary schools since 1st of September, and since 16th of September, universities were reopened and restrictions on public events were lifted. Also, 14 days home uh, quarantine after 21 day quarantine in the designated place was canceled. Since the first restriction phase started, a total of 20,108 citizens have returned to their homeland via air and land railway transportations. Please move next slide. As for now, a total of the seven, uh, 76,170 people were tested for COVID-19 and 20 uh, 7,763 people were under surveillance. We use epidemiological investigation and COVID tests and mandatory quarantine for suspected cases, contact us and all, transfer, uh, all travelers to Mongolia regarding to find active cases. Please move to next slide. Let's move to the second session. That is, uh, how is the radiation therapy seriously impact, inf impacted by the pandemic in my country? I would say that there is uh, no effects on the radiation service in my country. As you can see, average number of the patients in a day uh, in a before, uh, during the pandemic is same, which is around 70 to eight. Also, you can see in the below, the uh, number of the patients treated in last year from January to September were around uh, 600. And this year it is almost the same. The main issue we are facing right now is that returning cancer patients who had been treated abroad must undergo mandatory 21 days of isol isolation and uh, for 14 days of the self-quarantine despite the circumstances. If they need radiation treatment immediately, they have to wait more than one month regardless. Could you move to the next slide? Uh, there is a no change in the number of physical multidisciplinary teams and virtual tumor board in our hospital. Please move, next slide. There is no specific radiation therapy protocols for cancer patients infected with COVID-19. Since there is no patients are confirmed with COVID-19. However, our hospital developed guidelines for manage managing cancer patients and services during COVID-19 pandemic. Please move to next slide. We, we are following safety protocols for both of patients and medical staffs and COVID-19 related guidelines, which is provided by hospital and the Ministry of Health. If suspected positive cases is detected 
uh, by the position, position. First, the position must contact to higher officials. And after that, we will follow a required guideline. Please move to the next slide. We are screening for the COVID-19 symptoms for all patients, staff, visitors to hospi our hospital and requiring the public to wear masks and use sterilization and keep social distance. Please move, next slide. We are also limiting entry point of our building, which is only for during work hours or also only for staff or patient visitors. By limiting entry point, we can control the crowd in, inside of the building to avoid making unnecessary interaction. We also train all our staff regarding the safety protocol and guideline of COVID-19 if positive case is detected. Not to mention that we are fully supplied PPE. Move, please move to next slide. If cancer patient is infected with COVID-19, we will comply the uh, safety protocol guidelines. After that, we will classify the patients based on relevance of required treatment. We will prepare hyperfractionation for radiation therapy and we'll use telephone or online technology to contact, uh, review and follow patient and to making appointments for new patients to reduce visit to the hospital. Could you move to please? Uh, this is uh, the hospital level triage and as isolation for COVID-19 patient in the therapy area. The schema shows area where infection may be detected and location of isolation room, direction to the isolation room and direction to nearest exit, etc. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ulna. Um, it is very good to see you again on online. Um, also to hear that the uh, Mongolia was very successful in terms of um, stopping the COVID infection. And also, I was very impressed to hear that the, your department, even without the all those patients with, with COVID, you are very being ready for the case if um, those pandemic occurs again. And um, I think I was really impressed. So thank you very much for the presentation. Um, next, I uh, would like to go to the, the, the last but not least, um, the, to Sri Lanka. Um, Dr. Nadalaja Jayak, Kumaran, uh, Dr. Jayakumaran is the is a consultant clinical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute Institute of Sri Lanka, and he is the vice president of the Sri Lanka College of Oncologists, which is the the organization participating in Faro from Sri Lanka. So without further ado, I'd like to give the microphone to Dr. Nadalaja. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, to, today, my topic is uh, cancer care services in Sri Lanka during COVID-19 pandemic era, sharing the experience. So this in this one, you can see the graph uh, where the slowly increased and now again uh, on October 4th uh, we are having a sudden increase in COVID uh, uh, infection. Uh, this is because of some sporadic um, uh, some local problems in a district, Damba district. So this is the current situation. Actually we had total confirmed cases of 4,488. Uh, at the moment active cases 1,179 uh, but we had only 13 death, but it's a good thing. Uh, if you see these two, both the same uh, Sri Lanka, but if you see in the left side, uh, it, where the COVID-19 affected the areas are put it on green shadow, but in Colombo, that is the city of Sri Lanka, where it is very high, 
that's why the red center is the near the Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka. But the, on the right side, you can see the uh, Sri Lankan map where uh, we have nine provinces. In each provinces, we have uh, radiation units. But you can see the atom blinking ones are the centers where radiotherapy facilities are also available. Only two centers we are not having radiotherapy facility at the moment. So if you see both uh, maps, you will understand that the center which is in Colombo would have affected much because it's uh, the main center, the National Cancer Institute is situated in Colombo, the Western province. Again, you can see this um, uh, paper news article. The first patient with coronavirus was reported in Sri Lanka on January 27th. It's an imported case Sri that is actually from a Chinese woman admitted to the uh, infectious disease hospital in Sri Lanka. And she recovered and went back home. Then again, our first local case was reported on March 11th, uh, long time after the first case. Uh, that is actually, she said, to our guide who actually uh, went with the Italian tourists and got the infection. But still, he also got admitted and he has gone back home safely. Uh, this is actually the things I wanted to tell is that uh, this government of Sri Lanka has taken a lot of steps to uh, uh, control the COVID infection. His Excellency, the President, involved in all the uh, actions because uh, with his team and the, uh, the uh, think tank, uh, every time it was reviewed. In the February 1st, actually, the people, the students who have gone abroad, especially in China and Pakistan, where they have got stuck with COVID, um, places were evacuated and brought back to Sri Lanka and kept in quarantine. And they all have been safely sent home because of the parents got panic and so on. So it was addressed. Then on March 6th, Actually, a lot of um, actions were taken with uh, many uh, relevant people, health ministry and so on. And actually, they have formulated scientific mechanism to prevent the disease from entering to Sri Lanka and carry out a continuous campaign to build the public awareness programs to uh, stop spreading this nasty COVID-19 infection. Then March 12th, and they have stopped the canceling, canceled the online visa uh, and also uh, they quarantined all those who have come from abroad, especially from Italy and South Korea. And uh, they were kept for two weeks and also other people also were kept for some time and released. Then uh, April 1st, the economical things were discussed and but August 5th, uh, we, we have conducted the uh, parliamentary election and a lot of people participated and they have followed the social distancing you can see in the center of the uh, picture. Uh, amid the controlling of the pandemic, government enforced strict strategy, case detection and uh, followed by the identification of contacts and then quarantining them. Uh, some were uh, kept at home quarantine and travel restrictions by curfew that's locked isolation of villages which have been affected uh, mostly and other control measures like spraying disinfectant and minimizing human movement all uh, Closure of schools, preschools, uh, well ahead it was done and there were alternative methods of teaching with to Zoom or electronic measures were conducted, same with universities. And prohibition of uh, a mass gathering that is a festival or um, closure of social or cinema and um, this gardens and zoo and all this declaration of public holidays and um, they were into work from home set up and food and medicines were uh, implemented uh, this one you can see that uh, that uh, uh, this um, stringency index. We had a high stringency index, actually. The stringency index is uh, um, uh, sort of, um, um, the University of Oxford has made uh, this sort of um, indexing where to get the highest uh, number, like 100% and so on, uh, very quickly. It is a very good score that uh, depends on the services, um, uh, the clause, and the uh, stop, the, uh, 
um, whatever the factors which affects this uh, or which provocate uh, uh, spread of COVID infection and so on. So we are well ahead and we had a good uh, stringency index. And that's why we could able to have uh, less death. Uh, many steps again were taken by our college also. Press release was released, uh, guidelines to cancer patients was offered in the mass media and social uh, this one services and, and the other thing is and hand washing areas were set up and you can operate by the foot by the IG area and the patients have to make easy and they can easily and ease them and we also tried the trials and that means very simple different lines and they were tackled by the people who were wearing full ppe respiratory rewards we had and those who were suspicious were put to respiratory reward and pcr sent to only two cases we had positive cases sent to in the radiotherapy department and they were sent to the assigned COVID hospitals and then those who had contacts were kept in quarantine and provision of PPE also we didn't misuse it in the clinics we usually use the face mask face shield and gloves only but in theater or in places very suspicious the respiratory ward and so on full PPE were used and PCR testing done for uh, suspected or who have come from the lockdown area or who have to work. This is the release that uh, the Sri Lanka College of uh, Oncologists made it to the public. Uh, they, they say that the, during that time, patients who have completed active treatment, we are refrained from coming for other investigations like routine investigations, ultrasound scan, CT scan, chest X-ray, mammogram, ELA one, and so on. And patients who have completed cytotoxic treatment but who need ongoing medication like tamoxifen or thyroxine or the oral tablets, uh, we asked any representatives to come and collect it and quickly they can go one personally limited the visitors to and patients who are on the active treatment chemotherapy radiotherapy or planned surgeries we ask them to come and attend for that without any effects for their cancer growth and if you have any respiratory symptoms or any suspicious symptoms towards COVID, we ask to go to the nearby medical hospitals medical the centers where they can be directed to the COVID hospitals like we have uh, announced it in the mass media and TV and uh, and also we have operated teleconferencing through telephone and so they can contact those are hotlines in each people used to call and come to our clinic so this is the other languages in Singhala and Tamil also the same uh, sort of information given to the public this is actually our secretary is giving the uh, this packages for the PPE to other centers from our main center. And then impact of COVID pandemic in cancer care services, we'll have to do this a main topic. So radiotherapy and hypofractionated for breast cancer. And now some for trial of the way we have used high for the palliative care and pain relief on a single fraction centigrade, single fraction and uh, and treatment interruptions that we have calculated and meaning the CR testing done surgery, especially cancers or patients with symptoms. Identified cases, respect reward we have sent to and consequently they have been transferred to uh, the COVID-19 hospitals. So we plan, uh, preferably we use the most of the chronic things, WhatsApp group, we had WhatsApp group for information sharing or any sharing or any new information from the world and uh, we had the telephone, telehealth for the pay and email system and Zoom for mainly teaching through Zoom and the, even the school children were taught through Zoom and I think the television they were 
free channels were there for coronavirus crisis continuing uh, coverage and some discussions were, went on and even some channels, educational channels uh, were operational in the, um, for the students. Close. And actually the impact of COVID pandemic in cancer care services, as I earlier mentioned, the Western Province National Cancer Institute has affected by with situation very badly compared to the other hospitals. So we thought of uh, analyzing the mainly the National Cancer Institute statistics and to see how the number of new patients, new clinic visits, endoscopy examinations, CT imaging, and radiotherapy treatment, OPD chemotherapy treatment, and surgery got affected by this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So this is the number of new patients when we compared the last year with this year, uh, from January till August, the situation was, you can see that in 2020, we had a very badly affected the number of new patients coming to, coming to our hospital. So especially the very lowest in April, that is p-value is 0 0.06. Then if you see the clinic visits, uh, that again this, to that uh, in April very badly affected, uh, p-value is 0 0.07. And in the number of admissions affected during this period, COVID, that is the from March to May, it's affected a lot and April is worse. Uh, this is the number of blood transfusions. Again, that's also has come down, but p value is not so significant, 0 0.09. Uh, this is again endoscopies. You can see the two curves uh, separated well ahead. That means the p value is very, very significant. And because endoscopies are because the, the, this aerosol generating procedures and other things, and uh, when you do that, some spread may occur. So they have avoided this unless you need for some urgent cases. Another thing is number of imaging to affected uh, very badly between uh, February till May, so very badly in April. Then the number of CT scenes done is not so affected, but anyway, still it's coming down. But we have done few selected cases for planning. And this is the radiation treatment, overall external beam radiation treatment too. When you see overall, it's got ready reduction, you can see but the significant level reduction is there. But if you see the linear accelerator radiotherapy, it is not so affected because we are planning. Because already we had a lot of waiting lists like one month, one and a half month. So it was continuing like that. And we were calling the people over the phone and they are coming on time. We had the appointment time strictly we followed that. And they also have been undergoing all the checks and trials and coming for the radiation and going back soon. So if we preferred to come without any visitor, single, as a single person, unless they need some chaperone to um, accompany them. And this again, radiotherapy in cobalt, you can see very much um, uh, dissociating. Because these are cobalt, usually we are using for palliative care. And whenever this sort of situation, when the linear accelerator is freely usable, so we have moved to linear accelerator treatment. So we, that's why the cobalt treatment is less, even the palliative part. We are given pain medication, morphine, tramadol, and sort of things even to the delay the treatment and so on. So this, you can observe the uh, trend that is lesser usage of cobalt. Then this is the brachytherapy usage. Brachytherapy usage also in the, during the lockdown time, it's very, very much affected. Uh, then uh, day chemotherapy unit also, a um, lot of uh, people haven't come for that. And also we have, we have avoided um, bad and very, uh, toxic chemos, we sometimes reduce, uh, gone for the, um, without much affecting chemos only we have given. This is again radioactive iodine, you can see, uh, April, May, June, there's no, care, no cases were given, no patients had radioactive iodine, because we are not having radioactive iodine in our country. So we have to get down from uh, England and so on, so we have to uh, get it through airport, so everything closed. So that's why it is uh, less, it is zero. Uh, then number of surgeries done. This also, these two girls in 2019 and 2020 created out because there's lesser number of surgeries happened during this time. Uh, so this P is very, very highly significant. 
Uh, this is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic uh, on cancer care in National Cancer Institute, Maharagama, Sri Lanka. We made a small presentation for them to be published this one. And another uh, one among our Southeast Asian countries also, we have taken part in the comprehensive review on working of radiation on in COVID-19 pandemic and adapting it for South Asia setting. For the Zoom meetings, uh, our colleague, Dr. Lakshman Obeyes, took part in this. Uh, so um, in some or other, with our early intervention and uh, 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 social distancing and uh, other uh, strict uh, guidelines because usually when this law is uh, well implemented like in US so you have human rights situation and comes over and it's sometimes uh, people want freedom of movement and so on so they can't be kept in within the houses and so on forever like that so there's some breaks happens in those countries but sri lanka india and other places when this uh, law is implemented is implemented and so people are adhering to the law and so on very well you know, during the situation and uh, unfortunately north of october onwards we are having a few more but uh, lockdown was made in that particular area it's actually um, uh, and this um, garment factory and they are tracing try to trace the contacts and isolated many people and um, they kept in the quarantine and uh, trying to uh, contain that and uh, i think we'll succeed it thank you thank you dr jay kumar it was really wonderful and very comprehensive and it was very important uh, message which has come from the uh, the sri lanka uh, mainly i mean i'm really excited that you have made this all uh, the whatsapp and all those groups uh, good education and that was surprising that uh, uh, by something like july or june july the number of cases especially in the opd has really come to the normal one so i hope that uh, i mean is that true that now the the hospital attendance is almost the same as that of uh, the earlier period dr jay kumar i think we have lost him somewhere mm maybe uh, yeah, yeah i think i uh, think uh, should i ask yes, uh, dr tomo now, to now it's oh, yeah. sorry oh, no, no. sorry back, sorry yeah. yes. dr jay could you hear us yes yes yeah no, i was just uh, just situation. it was very nice presentation and now probably you are getting almost a similar kind of patients now after the the patients were uh, less and now it is almost yes. the same level yeah i think mm. yeah we may have yeah lost his i connection. think i think we have lost his connection yeah. i think for i think uh, thank you very much it was really wonderful and may I ask tomo if you want to uh, make some comments on that and then well i think the uh, all the uh, we heard a very good presentations for all of the seven uh, countries and i was um noticing that the status of the pandemic and the scale of the pandemic varied um very much among the seven all of them and i think the those difference is in a way good um each of us has something to learn from other countries um and i think this is a very good start for faro from the first webinar and this second webinar where um we can start sharing the information and learn and also move on further to um hopefully compile this information and produce something that's very useful for ourselves and for the everyone outside of age too so 
Um, I hope we continue this and I'd like to really thank all the presenters um, this week and two weeks ago and also the, uh, the organizer from the uh, Indonesia especially for making this happen. And I think this is a very good start. Um, with that, so yes, uh, Miriam, please. Yeah. Uh, just a very short comment before we end, just to thank all, all the speakers for their excellent presentation. And certainly we learned a lot from each other. The feedback from the first webinar from uh, from from my group is that they really learned a lot and it was very good and I think this is a, a good way for Faro to to launch the more webinars in the future. Thank you, of course, to Professor Tati and her group um, in Indonesia for for um, for this excellent uh, platform in a very short time and we are planning to have a, a, a third one hopefully. Uh, we are already thinking about that. So anyway, that's just my comment. Thank you to everyone, to Sham, Professor Thank Nakano, you. to Junlin, Thank to you. the Junlin, and uh, everyone else. Of course, Professor Tati and Mayang, who is the overall coordinator. And thank you to the speakers of uh, Dr. Nagata and Mani from the Philippines, and who else? Uh, Professor Fahim and um, Njai. Um, and uh, the, Dr. Uran from Mongolia also, and the last speaker from Sri Lanka, Dr. Jayan. I hope I didn't miss anyone. And of course, Sashri from Indonesia, my very good friend. <laughs> and I'd like to say hi to everyone. Thank you. Let's keep the faro alive and like this, and just very uh, casually, we can share our information without being too formal about it. And it's so easy to to contact each one and hopefully we can also publish a paper, something really truly from Asia, radiation oncology. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. And I'll request if there are some comments from Professor Nakano and Professor Tati, they've been quite uh, quiet right now. So if there are some comments, that will be really great. Professor Nakano and uh, Professor Tati. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is first time to uh, for me to attend uh, this kind of international parallel uh, webinar, and uh, I think this uh, system, uh, this kind of uh, web meeting is very uh, useful for parallel uh, radiation oncology. So that uh, I hope uh, we will invite. Uh, uh, um, other activity uh, through this kind of web uh, meeting uh, under Faro. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tati. Yes. Thank uh, you, Professor Makano. It was really nice. Thank you. So it is, uh, yeah, we are very happy. It's a great honor for us to arrange, uh, organize this kind of webinar. And I saw that uh, the, the, the participants is increased increase uh, compared with the uh, two weeks ago and we are very happy for that is that we know that uh, uh, there will be a fruitful benefit for all of us especially for our patients and uh, all of us I mean uh, uh, residents actually it is organized by our residents but my young is not anymore the resident he just graduated become a young medicine oncologist so Mayang now is a radiation oncologist, not anymore the residents, right, Mayang? But all the uh, uh, personals behind Mayang are residents, so we are happy to do it. And we will uh, discuss with others to have another another webinar, a real scientific webinar after this. Uh, I hope we hope we can we can uh, manage it uh, again. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tati. And um, it was really very nice and really we were excited uh, to know the status from the various countries. At least uh, we have the presentation from these 14 countries. And it is extremely useful and uh, I'm sure that we have learned so much and obviously something uh, can be planned for further. It was really very nice to, so, uh, to see that 
the various government organizations and the institution itself have taken the steps to curb the situation of the COVID-19. And we are really waiting that uh, some period of time, just not only on a virtual platform, we all can meet sometime. So maybe I am quite hopeful that maybe in 21, we'll have some meeting and meet each other and when can greet each other. So thank you very much for meeting. And now, now as uh, Professor Tati, you have said that all the young people have organized this one, wonderfully done. Mayang and the whole team, we really give three cheers to them. Mm -hmm. And uninterrupted, fantastically, it has been done. So great, very nice. To, and thank you very much, Professor Tati, your leadership in Indonesian group for this uh, webinar. And I'm sure all over the uh, the younger people from the Japan and from the Indonesia, which you have seen, and from the other countries, will join hand, will come up with something much better so that uh, we oldies, we oldies can also learn from them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We give it to Mayang. Anything, uh, 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 Tomo, you want to say? No further. I would like, I'm just happy to have this completed with success. Thank you. Great, great. I'm so happy.